What if instead of sending your clients a report as a PDF from QuickBooks, you could invite them to a suite of interactive reports where they can drill down on any number, gain insights, and easily communicate with you about any report, account, total, or even an individual transaction? What if you could do this for free? Stay tuned to hear more from our sponsor, Digits, later in the episode. I think what what is happening is that managers don't know how to manage people who they can't see. They think that talking to people and walking around and looking over their shoulder is management, and it's not. And that's an illusion. And so it's exposing the bad managers. I mean, you know, most, most managers do not add value in organizations, in my opinion. Like half of them are a waste of space. No, think about the managers you've had. I think it's higher. How, I think it's higher. It's higher. <laughs> Coming to you weekly from the OnPay Recording Studio, this is the Cloud Accounting Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. David, I'm not as well prepared as I would like to be this week. I, I might say the same. I had a little under the weather. I think I had a little post-conference something going on this Monday, Tuesday of this week. I had something. It, it wasn't COVID, but it was I talked something. to a couple of their attendees. They all had something too. It was oh, yeah. Yeah. like, yeah, like no, a 36-hour was, was, flu or something, right? There was an outbreak. This is going to be a thing now at every conference we go to. It's just the, the reality we live in, I suppose. The, the outbreaks to get over. Um, but there was still news that happened. Oh, yeah. Well, and that's why I feel a little bit bad that I don't know more about what's going on because... Elon Musk is in the news again, and it's about ESG. And I've been really wanting to talk about ESG, but I just haven't figured out how do we bring this into the show. And now our friend, Elon Musk, has Set the table delivered us. He's, he's laid it on a platter with his tweet. May I read you his tweet? Okay. Exxon is rated top 10 best in world for environment, social, and governance, ESG, by S&P 500, while Tesla didn't make the list. ESG is a scam. It has been weaponized by phony social justice warriors. That was on May 18th at 9.09 a.m. So Elon is going after ESG, environmental, social, and governance reporting, which is something that's really hot in the accounting profession because the AICPA and thought leaders are all talking about how ESG is the future and accountants are going to save the world. I think we had a... But- with ESG. Five months ago, there was a blog post. It was literally written by somebody outside the industry about how accountants are going to save the world with the ESG yeah. accounting. And, and that's crazy that ex- the oil company got that nod. And you're right, Tesla non list, which arguably, like, depending on how you, you know, arguably Tesla might be one of the most important, the, the electric car made by Tesla might be one of the most important things that have been invented in the last 100 years, possibly, arguably. Who knows? Yeah. We'll see where it all turns out. But, like, it's forced all, like, we have an electric car that I think goes into production this week. We're getting the the Ford Mach E. My wife's getting a new car. Oh, you're getting the, an the, electric, the, the, right. 100% electric. Now, would the Ford Mach E be even being made? Would it even exist if it wasn't for Elon Musk and Tesla? Tesla. I I really doubt it. Right? He made the electric car fun and sexy. Well, he forced and, them. Like he forced their hand. Right? They yeah, have he, to he, finally do it. Right. Right. By making a good electric car. That people wanted to have, and uh, well, let's get to the the, the numbers. Story. How, how did well, the accounting work in this? Well, so so S and P five hundred, you know, they rate companies on ESG. So they have an ESG index or something, and then there's funds that will trade. You know, they commit to only invest in ESG companies, and this is not a standard that exists in the government, right? This is not a government standard. ESG is different. Every ratings agency or, or group that does ESG has their own methodology. And, and you might be wondering, like, why did Tesla get kicked off of the list? And it has nothing to do with their environmental record. They have a great environmental record. They, they produce electric cars that have no emissions. It's because they had this, uh, you know, this labor issue with discrimination in their factories. And that's the S in ESG. And so this is one of the things that I don't personally, I don't get about ESG ratings, which is how can you combine environmental and social and governance into a single rating? Like, and that is how you get a situation where ExxonMobil 
can get a good ESG rating and Tesla gets kicked off of the list. And isn't it weighted by like credits? You can kind of buy your way out. Like, like what do they call it? Greenwashing, right? It's all greenwashed. Right. Well, and, and that's the criticism of ESG reporting is that it's been co-opted by large corporations to look good. And that's how you have like oil and gas companies on this list. And like the Russian gas company, Gazprom or something has been on the ESG list. You know, I mean. So, so that's what I'm thinking in our space, right? Okay. So now the big four are going to do audits of the clients that they're also have tax engagements with, right? And audit engagements. It's another going to do ESG audit. Right. They're not going to actually find it. They're not going to call out their clients for being shitty to the environment. Like, I don't know. Like, well, it's just, right. this is just another, accounts are going to be able to make money on this, but it probably doesn't actually help society at all. This whole ESG thing. I don't well, th that's the open question is, will the SEC getting into it actually make things better? And by standardizing it, it's possible. So in March, the SEC you came You mean like just with, another standards board? Like, yeah, a, yeah. we so, really need this. Yeah, just so the way the SEC has responsibility for generally accepted accounting principles yeah. and delegates that to FASB, they're going to do the same thing for ESG or they're proposing to. So there's a draft out that lays out what exactly companies have to disclose, what they have to report on, and when they're going to have to do it. There's like three different stages of ESG reporting. And but th th it's crazy because people are just going to vote with their dollars eventually. What do you right? mean? Like they're going to buy a bunch of electric cars. Like they're going to buy solar panels. They're going to buy... Um, water heaters that are instant water heaters and not gas powered, right? Like there's people are eventually the market will reward the companies that do this on their own. You don't do you need rankings and accounting for it. Do you need another government agency? Now it's probably good for accountants, but like, do you need this other agency? The market will solve this. I mean, maybe I, I guess the, the idea with ESG is you give investors information about environmental impact in addition to financial impact. Or profits yeah, yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like, I get the spirit of it. You're disclosing informed. the damage you're causing to the earth. Right. I get it. But that only works if the information that ends up getting reported is meaningful and useful and isn't just manipulated. Yeah. So, so what is the SEC proposing? They're proposing that uh, there's three scopes or three different types of information that are going to be reported. And, and scope one is direct. This one seems like the most obvious. Although I still, I don't know, I did some Googling and I couldn't find a definition for how this is calculated, but scope one is you have to report on the direct greenhouse gas emissions that your company creates. So if you're ExxonMobil and you create this product in the, in the process of making, you know, gasoline, let's say you have emissions that you create and you have to report on that. And that's quantifiable. And that I can actually see as being kind of a useful piece of information and accountants could audit this. We could, we could figure that out. Right. So if, if you're an airline, when you fly people around, how much greenhouse gases do you emit in the course of a year? And you could see, you could compare companies. Like some companies are going to have little, some companies are going to have more. But here's the thing. That doesn't encompass all of the company's impact. Because let's say you have a company that is produces no greenhouse gas emissions, but uses a ton of electricity. Like a, a I don't know, a blockchain company. Yeah. So that's where scope two comes in, which is indirect. So you have to then quantify the greenhouse gas emissions of all the electricity and energy you purchase. And then I, I start to wonder, how is that going to be possible? So let's say I mine Bitcoin and I buy electricity to mine Bitcoin. I have to figure out the greenhouse gas emissions of the utility that produces the electricity that I buy. How would I know that information? Right? Yeah. And then it goes even one step further. There's going to be scope three reporting, which is additional indirect greenhouse gas emissions from all upstream and downstream companies in the value chain. So somehow I'm going to have to figure out not just the electricity I purchase, but also the, the f business travel that my employees did and the greenhouse gas emissions of that and the greenhouse gas associated with all the, the goods and services I am buying and my leased assets and my employee commuting and the transportation and distribution of all of my goods and 
the use of my products that I sell? Like, does that create waste? What happens to the waste of the products that I create? Like, it, do you, do you see this how whole thing scope, feels like this whole this thing scope. feels like let's get it on the books because the next step will be we'll give a tax break for this. This is actually probably being created by corporations to work this into them. It'll be another thing they could get a tax break for, right? And the compliance to calculate this, be in compliance to get this tax break is going to be so pro- prohibitively impossible to do. Only the richest, biggest companies are going to be able, like an Exxon will ever be able to take advantage of this. It, this whole thing's being set up to keep competition down. I don't know. I'm, maybe that's possible. I guess the problem I have with this is just that the scope is so broad when you get into indirect greenhouse gas emissions yeah. that it just seems completely impossible. I mean, it would be like asking financial reporting to report on the upstream and downstream financial impact of all of the goods I purchase and sell as part of my business. Well, think like, about just the podcast. I have electricity like, coming through Tucson Electric. You were getting your electricity from whoever up in Phoenix. Yep. Right? Yeah, the a- APS. APS. We're now, running- now my electricity is mostly generated by a nuclear plant. Yep. We're Where's using your electricity generated from? Maybe coal. I don't know. <laughs> right. say but, hey, are we quantifying the impact of the nuclear- waste storage that we are going to have to do someday. But then I mean, it's not, you know, but this shows a complication because then we're running with Zencaster, which for all I know runs on an Amazon server, right? Like, we're, yeah. Right. Yeah. How would we, how would we possibly calculate the Just impact? for this little show. The, Just for the Cloud County right podcast. Now. Yeah. Like, <laughs> there's no, I, I, so somebody, I get credit if I have a solar tube lighting me up right now, right. I, I'm, I do not have a light bulb on. Do I get credit for that? So here's the problem. This data is only useful if it's comparable. If you can compare one company to another and actually look at their emissions and say this company on net. You mean like standardized financial reports that are yes. so reliable and we can compare companies back to back and that accurately prices their stocks? Is this what we're trying to do again? And here's my criticism of all okay. this ESG stuff is that we don't even accurately do EPS right now, right? Because Gap accounting hasn't changed in 100 years. It's still built for the industrial era. And so it can't properly calculate the earnings and of, of subscription-based businesses, of businesses that are based on intangible assets. Wait, wait. <laughs> so, this, and like, if you have good ESG, they're just going to roll that into goodwill probably. It'll just be more good. <laughs> just more goodwill on balance sheets? <laughs> balance sheet. Just like, yeah. yeah. So, so I think, you know, I, I don't want to tie myself to Elon Musk and I think the listeners of our show will know that I don't always agree with him, but I think he's got a really good point here with ESG that it is, it's, it's so phony. And I have a hard time seeing how this could ever be properly regulated the way, I mean, I see, I could see direct. You can calculate the environmental emissions of your company directly. That could be done, but all the indirect stuff, it's asking accountants and analysts to do calculations on information that they don't have and can't possibly obtain. And it'll just be a big mess. And it won't be useful to anyone. It's just going to create a lot of costs. It'll create a lot of work for the big four, which is probably why they're pushing it so heavily. But it's not going to be great for investors. It'll just create more confusion. So anyway, that's that's my take on it. Take on it. And that's my <laughs> opinion. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Canopy. Accounting practice management software should bring together all your firm's mission-critical functions in one place. Client management, document management, workflow, time and billing, and payments to keep your team organized. Canopy knows that not all firms are on the same practice management journey or timeline, so Canopy lets you build your practice management platform as you need it. You start with client management as your foundation, then you choose the modules that your firm needs. And since nobody likes paying for modules they don't use, they offer modular pricing as well. Canopy integrates with QuickBooks Online, Xero, FreshBooks, CRMs, form builders, spreadsheets, calendars, email, and Zapier. They have a mobile app, centralized file management, fillable PDFs, a client portal, task management, and the list goes on and on. Via their integration with the IRS, you can easily retrieve all your clients' transcripts, notices, and child tax care credit payments without leaving Canopy. To try Canopy free for 30 days, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash Canopy. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash C-A-N-O-P-Y. Should we talk a little about about, about hiring? Yeah. So one thing I thought was interesting, you know, because obviously everybody... 
you got to get to people younger, right? Help them out. So KPMG has a, their audit department. There's, they're going to have a CPA program to pay new hires to study. So when they hire you, you get two months at 40 hours a week to go study and they're going to pay you during they're this time. They're going to pay you to study for your CPA exam. But like, hasn't this just always been done by all the big firms for the longest time? Or am I correct, incorrect in this assumption? Not really. I mean, you were just expected to do it in your spare time, which would often like be the off season, the non-busy season. But now that busy season seems to go on forever, I guess this is necessary. They have to actually set aside the time for you. Time to get that done. Okay, got it. And so then they they said they're going to uh, work on this with a third-party review course and say which one. And, uh, you know, they're committed to that. But the other article I saw about hiring, which I think is really eye-opening, and it ties into our space, like the AICPA, right? We're trying to get people to learn accounting maybe in high school, right? They're kind of on board, some of these things we talked about. So I don't know if you saw this about Walmart's hiring. Yeah, yeah. So Walmart can't retain enough store managers. Is that what you're talking That's about? That's exactly it. So what they've done is they've started recruiting as early as high school and college to start recruiting people into becoming a career path with Walmart, store managers have an average annual salary of $210,000. It's not an easy job. It's, I'm That's sure it's not easy. other counterpart. You get paid highly. I mean, it's not it's like a- being a partner at a firm, maybe. I don't know. But like... I mean, think... Well, given the amount of people you have to manage, you know? Yeah. Like, there's a lot of workers at a Walmart, right? You're responsible for... This but you little... kind of, but but and maybe at a firm or it's super competitive. Maybe at a Walmart, you're the big fish, yeah. right? Right, so, right. But well, even they were talking about this. This follows up an announcement a month ago, where Walmart they're launching their fleet development program, and they've lifted the starting pay for their truck drivers to one hundred and ten thousand dollars a year. So we're here in this industry where the wages are not going up. Yeah, starting salaries of of auditors are like fifty, sixty thousand dollars. So or the IRS. The IRS needs to fill all these positions. They're gonna pay people twenty seven thousand dollars a year, or you could drive a truck for Walmart for hundred and ten thousand dollars a year. Yeah. So the numbers are just crazy. And obviously they're doing this because of competing with Amazon, right? But I just thought I thought those numbers were shocking. I mean that's I well, mean this is the, everything's this a headache, is, right? You work for a startup, it's a headache. Yeah. You work like every company's a headache, but two hundred and ten thousand is not bad. We have a huge demographic shift that's going on, and it was just accelerated by the pandemic, but this has been coming. I've been talking about this for years, the shortage of professionals. And Walmart store managers are true professionals. Like, you have to be educated, intelligent. You know, you, you it's not well, just One a store job. is a serious business. I mean, that's yeah, a, it's a, a monster serious, business. Yeah, yeah. So, like, just like with accounting, we've got 75% of CPAs eligible to retire in a few years, you know. It's the same problem with these experienced managers. A lot of them are retiring and they haven't been replaced. And we ha- we still have economic growth happening, so you can't just keep it static. And that's that's part of the the problem. We can talk about some more remote work stories. I'm I'm a big fan of remote uh, work. I have an article on that. Go ahead and jump in. Okay. Well, let's let's do this. So, uh, the story I saw was Apple. Apple is having to soften its stance on remote work. They were trying to increase the number of days in the office to three, and they lost a key executive as a result of that policy. One of Apple's highest, most valuable employees working on artificial intelligence, actually machine learning, his name's Ian Goodfellow. He's the former director of machine learning. He, he left the company and wrote an email about it internally that got leaked saying that the remote work policy or the end of the remote work policy was the reason he was leaving. And he went to work for Alphabet, which is Google's parent company. And so now Apple has scaled back. It's, it shows just how much of a challenge getting people back in the office is. People have lots of options, especially if you have a skill that's in real demand. Like you can just say, no, I'm not going to go back. And, and I that's think what we're San Francisco or the Bay Area has having a COVID up. Flare. Like it's interesting that some of the places that were the most locked down are now having this after the fact COVID up a little bit. And I think that's a little bit of it too. How, how do you bring people out the office if maybe there's a little uprising, of, not, uprising is not the right word, but an increase in COVID cases. Well, yeah. And, and COVID now is endemic, right? Yeah, so it's just around. Gonna, yeah. So, you know, let's, let's not forget that there were a lot of problems with the office before COVID. We just lived with it, right? Like getting sick constantly that was reality for most of us 
I would get sick at least once a year. And it was mostly due to the office. And then later, once I had a kid, it was because of, you know, hey, hey, bringing hey, stuff as soon as your kid daycare. goes to day, daycare, you have a two year period where you're sick every three weeks. Like you just can't yeah. eat fast. Yeah. Yeah. But like, you know, like that was reality and we just kind of all got used to it. And, and also just the, you know, the waste of time of driving into the office and the, the time you waste just getting distracted by office birthday parties and random people walking by and talking to you. And, you know, there's, there's just still so many people who don't believe the data and the data says people work more when they work from home. And I feel like there's people at Apple who, you know, don't believe that, or it's just, you know, you're an executive and for you as an executive, you like it when everybody's there. Cause you can just go talk to them. It's less effort for you. So you don't have any of the negative externalities of commuting because you're rich and you can afford to live close to the office. And in the case of Apple, probably like fly your helicopter and land in the middle of that spaceship building to get to work, right? So I saw an art article, that the, the headline caught me first, like 43% of remote workers miss water cooler chats with coworkers. They and when I those? saw that headline, I was actually I thinking, like, remember I made a comment maybe two episodes ago that were like, people actually don't want to go to meetings and see their coworkers. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Like, like, like that's, they don't even want to be in Zoom meetings. Like, that's the one advantage of being at home, right? But this tells me, you know, 57% of workers don't want to have water cooler chats with coworkers, right? But so this is a, a survey conducted by YouGov and then Otter.ai. Otter.ai is like an add-on to Zoom that transcribes everything you say during your meeting. And they, they interviewed 2,000 remote workers in the US and the UK to find out about remote working. So this is just going to be like me puking stats because that's the kind of this article was. So if we want to pause and discuss on one of them, if not, I'll just kind of yeah, puke just, this out. Yeah, just... Puke them at me, David. Puke them here. Just, um, just vomit all over, vomit numbers at just me. all over the place. So 40%, they believe that they've been working at home full time and they believe they'll continue to do so indefinitely. This is UK workers? Uh, UK and US, 2000. Okay. It didn't say exactly which, you yeah. know, what that percentage Profes- was. Professionals, I yeah. take it? Okay. 36% were also fully remote, but think they'll return full or part-time in the future to the office. 24% are hybrid and 20% of the home workers say they never want to return to the office. So one fifth, right? One out of every five yeah. people says they never want to go back to the office. Um, and then about 14% say they will when it's safe to do so. And then about 45%, so this is almost half, say they want a hybrid working environment. They're like, that's probably like, yeah. you know, you start thinking about a bell curve. It makes sense. Like maybe hybrid's the right, the right approach here. A right? couple other things. Uh, 42% say they have experienced Zoom fatigue, which I'm actually surprised it's only 42%. Yeah. M- maybe the other 60 just turn off Zoom and never even turn it on. So they don't experience it. They just skip the meetings entirely. Uh, there's some tips and this is where Otter, I, you know, these are self-serving statistics, but uh, to improve virtual meetings, more than half say they should always have agendas. Yes. Um, half the people think a meeting should have agendas. 35% believe they should only have to attend relative sections of meetings. So sometimes there's a meeting that's an hour and everybody's giving their updates. Maybe you only show up for your yeah. 10 minutes. That's a, that's a, that's an interesting one. 33%. So one third just argue all meetings should be shorter, which scares me because that means two out of three people think meetings <laughs> are perfect length, which is kind of surprising. Um, and then 26% say meeting notes should always be shared, which is like, obviously this is Otter's game, right? But that's actually not good as a business model. If only one out of every four people think they should share the meeting notes, why would you, why would your organization implement a tool like Otter AI if nobody's going to actually read the notes? And these are the real statistics. And this is why there's a drive to get back in the office, right? So this is some of the naughty things you might do during a virtual meeting. 31% to admitting having a private conversation with friends in virtual meetings, right? So you obviously you're using Slack or having a back channel conversation mm-hmm. while someone so is presenting. Mm-hmm. 30% have worn pajamas. 23% have shopped online. I think I maybe have done that once before. 15% have played computer games. This is why they want to have people back in. 9% of drink alcohol or have been drunk during remote meetings. This is why people want people back in the office. Numbers like that scare you, scare prime management. Okay, here's, here's another set of numbers for you. It'll right. put some of this in perspective. So this is from Robert Half, the staffing agency. They surveyed 2,400 professionals in the US. 41% of respondents say they are more burned out now, more than a year ago. Now, why are they more burned out? It's because if they can set their own schedule, 70% are working more hours than before the pandemic. So 
employers are worried that people aren't focusing and aren't working. But actually, they're working more. And as a result, they're more burned out than they used to be. Well, I think if you go back a year ago, there's even less people working now. So it's almost right, so like more, more people burn out, more people are dropping out of the workforce. Like it's, it's And they're not dropping out of the workforce. Faster. That's that's an interesting takeaway that I discovered recently. They're not dropping okay. out of the workforce. They are actually, a lot of people are just becoming self-employed and setting their you own terms. Yeah, those numbers. Yeah. So, so basically people are figuring out, hey, if I don't want to adhere to your schedule or get overworked by you, I can just go be a contractor and I can set my own hours and, you know, I can make a decent living. A good chunk of people are doing that now. Yeah, more than three quarters of professionals said they have the ability to set their own schedule. But among those respondents, 70% are working more hours than they were before the pandemic. Three quarters of employees overall are putting in 40 or more hours per week. So this, this is a myth that people work less when they work at home, when you can't see them. I think what, what, is, what is happening is that managers don't know how to manage people who they can't see. They think that talking to people and walking around and looking over their shoulder is management and it's not, and that's an illusion. And so it's exposing the bad managers. You can't, I mean, it's like office space where he just stands up at yeah. the top I of mean, the cubicle. You know, most, most managers do not add value in organizations, in my opinion, like half of them are a waste of space. I'm not going to answer this question. Um, well, no, think about the managers I, I, you've I, had. I think it's higher. How, I think it's higher. It's higher. I, I, yeah. How I many think... managers have you had that actually made you a better employee rather than just dragging you down? I mean, yeah, over my, I, I feel like not so much that on a career wise. I mean, I've had like, I've been lucky enough in my career to have some decent managers, but I yeah. think in general, when it comes to the production cycle, whatever you are making and you have whatever you're producing, I always feel like there's way more managers involved in the process that shouldn't be there and they're not contributing anything to to whatever you're making, right? Because really yeah. you're at work to make something and produce something. Yeah. And my, my least favorite stage in the startup life cycle is when you get this whole layer of managers who don't do anything other than manage. Because you'll have like two producers and like five people telling them what to do, yeah. you know? And, and actually the, the work from home environment sort of pointing that out and I think we're going to end up with fewer managers in the future, especially when it comes to professionals. Like, you know, the the best thing is like uh, this is one thing that's wrong with SaaS versus desktop days, right? I remembered into it, right? The, when push came to shove, eventually those CDs got to be pressed. If you miss your the factory space, there's a forty eight hour window to go get your CDs made in the olden days. And what would happen is that last week to get the product out the door, the bugs, the fixes decisions that need made, the managers that didn't have the actual experience to contribute almost had to step back and get out of the way or that product wasn't getting out the door. And it was always like great, like the amount of work that we get done in like a two week period to get QuickBooks out the door was amazing because all the management was gone. They were out of the way because they could, they, 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 because they, they were slowing down, they, they'd slow down the process, but then it would start up again. Like oh, now it's the next QuickBooks version. And then it would be slow for the whole year. And then the last two weeks, like it would just be the the doers, right? Pumping it out and getting and getting it to the finish line. But I think with SaaS, there's no real deadline, so it just kind of flails around. Like there's no deadlines, right? To to get things out the door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's funny. They stepped away and then you got more work done. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Digits. Digits is building accounting tools so powerful that you'll think they're from the future. Using digits is easy. You just connect it to QuickBooks and about 24 hours later, all your data will be fully analyzed, allowing you to use all the digits tools. Digits reports can generate all your clients' monthly reports all at the same time with just one click. And these reports aren't your typical boring static PDF reports. They're beautiful, interactive, and alive with the latest data. Digits search, you can use to quickly find and navigate directly to transactions inside of QuickBooks Online. And Digit's newest offering, Digit's Boost, will automatically notify you about miscategorized transactions, messy vendor data, and any personal identifiable information that you may want to keep private. You can then correct the data and push the changes back to QuickBooks Online without leaving Digit's. To learn more about Digit's and to sign up for free, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash Digit's. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash D-I-G-I-T-S. Digit's, finance from the future. Can I do a listener mail? Perfect. Catherine said, I just discovered your podcast and it's such a refreshingly frank take on my own experience that I'm floored. 
I started at Deloitte January 1999, a week out of grad school. I took that job because in the interview, I was told about the awesome training program and how I would shadow an auditor. Oh, you don't do accruals for a year. I got there all excited and thrilled to finally be out of school and in my first real job. This training was me and two other hires in a conference room with our laptops and the manual for the audit program. My first assignment that I was so excited to finally get to was absolutely awful. I was given a box of work papers and told to organize it. Organize it how? By color? I had never seen live audit work papers before. I had no idea what I was doing. My second assignment, I showed up and was told, look, no offense, but I'm really pissed off that they sent a first year when I told them specifically I don't have time to do any babysitting. Just sit over here, study for the CPA exam, and don't bother anyone. I literally read a man in full on that job, all 800 pages of it. I passed the CPA exam when I was still in grad school, so I had nothing to do. After that, I transferred to tax because I thought that if they were not going to train me, I can at least go on the IRS website and pull instructions and teach myself taxes in a way you just can't do an audit. As for budgets, I was one of those dumb, honest kids who put her real time on the timesheet, and it was a problem. It was even more obvious in tax how awful timesheets were. I'd be given a shoebox return, unopened envelopes, nothing organized, and that would be a one-hour budget. FFS, it takes longer than an hour to do my own taxes, and the kind of people who have Deloitte do their personal return have a lot more going on than I do financially. The way I saw it, you have a return that is a good solid 16 hour return. It takes you 16 hours, so you put 10 on your timesheet to look good. The next poor sucker gets a 10 or less hour budget. It takes them 16 hours and they put eight on their timesheet to look good. So on and so forth until some clueless first year shows up and accidentally tells the truth. I have my own firm now. I price by the job or form depending. I just started doing tax resolution work and after making about $2 an hour for not realizing how involved it would get, I'm having to bill that by the hour, but at least it's an actual hour and not a Deloitte hour. A Deloitte hour. A Deloitte hour. So thank you, Catherine, for that note. Uh, that is really interesting to hear your story there. Amazing. So, so you, David, you told this story about KPMG is now paying people to study for the CPA exam, right? Yeah. It sounds like that's just formalizing something. <laughs> that has been done informally where it's like, here, you don't know anything. Just go sit. Go and study study. That's, yes, maybe that's why I thought this existed before, right? Like people <laughs> yeah, yeah. were like, oh, they're, they're buying the study guides. I just study or whatever. That could be the reason why. The thing that Catherine said about the timesheets is funny, right? Where it's people constantly under shoot the budget to look good. And then every year it gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it's absurd, like an hour to do a 16 hour return. Yeah. I, I don't know. And, and you know? I, I don't know where I, where I was once. In some journey in my career, and I remember somebody told somebody else, like, oh, we can't have any all star. Like, you can't blow this, like, on the timesheet. Like, you got, don't do the work too fast, kind of a pl play, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, because it's going to ruin it for the rest of us. If you, if you do the work faster and put it on the timesheet, it ruins it for all of us. Right. Mm -hmm. That kind of that, that mindset. I, I wanted to talk about the IRS, right? IRS. So, so, so the, uh, the GAO, so the Government Ac uh, Accountability Office, had a report come out this week. And there's kind of three – this turned into like three different news articles. There's just a lot to do with it. One of them is like we beat this drum to death, you know, audit rates decreased, right? For, yeah, for I saw this story. Wealthiest, and, the, the, yeah. and it's really crazy. So like wealthiest taxpayers, those with incomes of $5 million or more, they're most likely to be audited. So this is a decade-long report. But their audit rates have now dropped by 86%. So they're still, you're still highly likely if you're over $5 million to be audited, but right. it's a lot less than it was a decade ago. Right. But let's talk about what the overall audit rate is. Did you see that stat? Read that. So the, from tax years 2010 to 2019, audit rates of individual tax returns decreased for all income levels. On average, the audit rate for these returns decreased from 0.9%. 0.25%. That's all income tax returns. You have so that's one quarter of 1% chance of being audited. So that's one out of 4,000 returns then? One out of 400. One out of 400, okay. Yeah, one in 400. Now that's all income levels. And if you're poor, you actually have a greater chance of being audited <laughs> because those, like as we've discussed, those audits can be automated. So- you know, uh, let's take a look at those rates. Yeah, if you if you claim the earned income tax credit, you have a you had a seventy point seven seven percent chance of being audited. 
And if you had an income of under $25,000, you had a 0.4% chance of being audited. So if you take out all the lowest taxpayer audits, which is a kind of a high number, pull those yeah. out, the odds of you actually getting audited is crazy low. It's probably yeah. lower than that one in 400. It's probably one in 1,000. It's 0.17% of those with incomes between 200,000 and 500,000. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's just, it, this is the... This is the problem. When audit rates are this low, when they're lower than 1%, I think it becomes really difficult to be ethical as a tax preparer because your clients are saying to themselves, I'm not going to get audited. Let's just do some of this fun stuff. And, and you see these stories all the time. People are asking their accountants to do stuff. Then TikTok's planting seeds in people's heads of things they can right. do. <laughs> like we we as as a profession, we need a strong IRS to enforce the rules that we are tasked with with uh, upholding our ethical obligation. I mean, if there is, it would be like, like if there's no law enforcement, right? It, you're going to have more crime, right? It's just, I don't, I, I don't know how to. No, I, I get it, right? Because like Airbnb is just for example, like some Airbnb does not send out a record of your sales or your rentals unless you break $20,000. So the way that's interpreted by my non-accounting friends is like, oh, if they don't send it out, you don't have to put this on your taxes. Like, you don't have to report it, right? Yeah. Well, and the chance of you getting audited is extremely low. It's Let's say it's one in 400. And then if you get audited, are they actually going to like dig into your bank statements and find that? Probably and then you could be like, chance, renegotiate right? that, right? You could pay a penalty. It might be, it, the, the gamble is kind of there now. It's worth the right. gamble. Right, Unless right, they make because penalties do, insane. Right, right, exactly. Because the IRS doesn't have the resources to really go after you in tax court. So you can just do an offer and compromise and settle it and be done with it probably for less than your original tax liability even. Yeah. So it's all this game, right? Yeah. And it's not good for the country and it's not good for our profession. Another part of the report that I like that came out is they, they want the IRS, they're recommending, but this is going to take laws acts of Congress, but they want the IRS to collect more demographic data. Because and we've talked about this in the past, like arguably tax code is racist. Tax code determines social policy is a reflection of social policy or vice versa, right? And But they don't have any real data to prove a lot of this. Like for all we know, a certain demographic of our population, besides poor people, <laughs> right, may be getting audited more. And they don't really have that kind of data. And it's important to um, do that because we just can't analyze how our tax system is impacting society. Like, well, yeah, it's funny going time back. ESG is going to figure out impact, but we can't figure out the impact of our own tax system right, on society. I got one bit of good news on taxes. The federal government's budget deficit has shrunk by $1.57 trillion so far this fiscal year. And that's due to record receipts from a strong economy and a slowdown in spending. Uh, as the pandemic era programs fade. The deficit was only $360 billion for the seven months from October through April 2022, according to Treasury Department data. So there's some good news. Yeah. Happening. Uh, Less of a deficit. The other thing that came out of this report, like this report was monstrous. So apparently, I, I guess, Blake, and I, I'm trying to, they don't say how this happens, but essentially this is the use case I'm thinking of. You, you know, We're both on some dating site. And you're thinking of going on a date with me, but you happen to work at the IRS. You just go pull up my return and check things out before we date. So this report exposed that, that the IRS had 1,700 1, 1, investigations of unauthorized access of tax data by employees. 1,700? Yes. Wow. For the decade between 2012, 2021. Oh. Now, okay. So that's like what? A, hun a couple hundred, a hundred yeah. or 200 a year? Yeah. Now, now the good thing is, is they found that 82% of unauthorized access violations resulted in an employee either being suspended, resigning, or removal. So, so like, it feels like the IRS is on top of this when it happens, right? Yeah, ex except when like the wealthiest Americans' tax returns get leaked to the press. <laughs> yes, they talked <laughs> about that. The never before seen record showing yeah. Bezos, Elon Musk, Warren Buffett. Or, or Trump's tax. returns, so it, right? It yeah. leaked, exactly. Yeah. But it's... You know, I'm trying to think of like why other, other than like the dating thing, or maybe, maybe you're in a divorce situation and you want to make sure the income your ex-spouse might be claiming, you could pull up the return. So it's a, uh, I could see how it's easily abused, but I think in the grand scheme, if you think about the number of returns over a decade, 
Yeah. And the number of IRS employees, I don't know if this is worth raising the fuss over. Until it's your tax return that gets released publicly, and then obviously then it's a problem. But. So another stable coin has lost its peg to the dollar. This is following Terra USD's spectacular collapse. Can we call these kind of stable coins now? Unstable coins. Unstable. That's even worse. Well, and it is another algorithmic stable coin, meaning that it wasn't actually backed by US dollars. It was backed by other cryptocurrencies and some sort of mechanism to then try to keep the price at a dollar. And these are inherently unstable. They can fail. They can go into what's called a death spiral. And that has also happened, uh, it looks like, with D. EI, which is now trading at uh, 57 cents on the dollar. And remember, this is something that's supposed to always maintain its peg to the US dollar at one. And it's kind of amazing to me that it hasn't like completely collapsed. Like you would think these things would go down immediately, but I guess they're still trying to prop it up. Well, my $11 is now worth $6.82. <laughs> so... Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, thank God I didn't put a lot of money in it. Yeah. The crypto bros, they, they would have led me astray. So the thing that's really hurting crypto right now, just from a, like a theoretical standpoint, is, is you know, the idea was always that, um, or one of the core ideas behind crypto was that it would be a hedge against inflation. And that has not happened at all. As the stock market is tanked, crypto is also tanked, which indicates that it's being used as a speculative asset not as a hedge asset like gold. And so that's kind of been, I, I think that's been, what what's the word for this? We've been disabused of this notion. Maybe we've been abused of it for too long. <laughs> and, and we already know like the, the main problem with, you know, the other promise of Bitcoin was it would replace money as a means of transacting. And that hasn't happened either. It's more expensive. It's less convenient. You can see what happened in, um, was it El Salvador? that adopted crypto and Bitcoin and like businesses aren't using it. People aren't spending it. It's not convenient. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to actually make crypto better than fiat currency in terms of transacting. And nobody's figured that out yet. And until they do, it's really just going to be a speculative asset. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Cinder. Tax season is over which means you can focus on growing your business rather than hustling to handle the clients you've already got. But how do you add new clients when you're already so busy? That's easy with Cinder. With Cinder, you can automate mundane tasks like reconciliation and categorization and instead spend more time on strategy. Thanks to Cinder's new e-commerce insights, you become a trusted advisor to your clients, not just a data entry clerk. Give them important tools to know their numbers and make the right decisions to grow their business. Over 2,000 CPAs are already future-proofing their business with Cinder as their secret solution. Ready to join them? To book your free demo, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash Cinder. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash S-Y-N-D-E-R. Should we jump into app news? Let's do it. Where do you want to start? Um, a really high level. Um, Square or box, I guess blocks now. Block, block, no, block, block, just block. They had their um investor day, and it's their first investor day in five years. And really, the big qu quotes here, which are interesting. So, this is one quote from their CFO, and this is a uh, Armita Ahua uh, told CNBC in a phone interview calling block a payments company is like calling Amazon a bookseller. And then the other one is from uh CEO co founder Jack Dorsey, who also you know started Twitter, he kicked off his presentation with a keynote about how Block and Bitcoin's role going forward. And he said, it's difficult to fit a company like Block into a single category, you know, because, you know, they own the thing with the music and you know, they're just everywhere. But I think for, as this moves forward, right, and it becomes a big ecosystem play, if they start keeping people closed in the ecosystem, like the money never comes out, like how does that impact like accounting and bookkeeping and this type of stuff? Right, like they could make it hard to get the data out. Mm -hmm. Like it, it just all lives in the Square ecosystem. Maybe they launch a GL, and then now it's all in there. And I think you saw this with Shopify and their bank account, because if you have deposits going straight in the bank account, it gets grayer what the deposit amount is. Right? It, yeah, yeah. I don't know. So that's out there. 
I don't think there was a other outside, outside those two quotes, just that it's much bigger than, you know, square now or block. Sorry. Here's a thought. Is it easier to train accountants on tech or technologists on accounting? Um, since I do feel like sometimes it's hard to train bookkeepers and accountants on accounting. <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like that already exists. Like maybe it's extra hard to teach a technologist about accounting. So Accounting Today has a series where they go out and they interview thought leaders, folks who know stuff, not me, in the profession and ask them questions. And this was one of the questions they posed. Is it easier to take a somebody who's good at technology and teach them how to do accounting? Or is it easier to take somebody who's good at accounting and teach them how to do technology? And I have to say, I, I think it would actually be easier to take somebody who is really good with tech and teach them how to do bookkeeping or teach them how to do accounting, but especially the bookkeeping thing, because a lot of accounts don't even learn how to do bookkeeping properly. And, uh, and that's what my, my interest, I have the accounting twins, like until they came and I showed them QuickBooks and my bookkeeping, they did not get any bookkeeping experience as accounting majors. And they just graduated with yeah. accounting degrees. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all theory, right? And <laughs> in theory, you know, it's not, it's not that useful. Especially when the theory is old, right? But but look, you don't have to listen to me. Let's let's hear what the thought yes. leaders have to say. So, and these thought leaders theory, are accounting professional thought leaders. Well, you can make your own judgment. Oh, this is a game. L. Gary Boomer, visionary and okay. strategist of Boomer Consulting, says it is easier to train technologists on accounting procedures than the other way around, at least when it comes to audit. He said it came down to a mindset difference, namely that those with tech backgrounds can approach accounting tasks with fresh eyes versus thinking strictly in terms of procedure. Auditors, he said, want to use technology, but their reports would still be following procedures that he said don't really add much value. When asked why they did this, he said, the auditor would reply that it was required. And when pressed on exactly who requires these steps, they reveal it's more of a personal preference. I think that is a very insightful comment that accountants often think based on procedure because that's how we're taught. We're taught this is how you do it, not necessarily why we do it. And I think that's a big problem. And that's what makes it hard for accountants to adopt technology because people who like technology are constantly searching for new ways to do things or questioning the way we did it in the past. And that's like the opposite of how accountants are taught in traditional accounting programs. We're just taught to do what's been done always. Because you have to compare it to the prior period and the prior period and the yeah, yeah. And and this is how most accounting standards are issued is it's it's rules based, it's not principles based. Back in the day, accounting standards used to be very principles based when they first were developed in like the late eighteen hundreds and early nineteen hundreds. And then we got the SEC, and the SEC had trouble coming up with standardization based on principles. And so they just eventually got more and more rules based. And now you end up with Revenue recognition rule books that are like 600 pages long, and yeah. there's no room. I, I, I mean, I think the, the technologist, it, it's there's some advantage of coming in green, but this other thing is, I always think it also makes them very blind to the fact that it's much harder than they think it's going to be. And it's not that they're cocky; they just yeah. underestimate the difficulty. Like, like accountants, bookkeepers, there's a lot of smart people in this industry. And you, you could say, yes, it's a motivation. They like to do things the old way, but there's a lot of brain power. And there might be a reason some things don't exist yet. So somebody who agrees with Gary Boomer is Jim Bork, partner and managing director of the advisory service practice at Top 100 firm Witham, who employs both. At least in the realm of analytics, he said, it is easier. It really is to train data scientists on accounting than accountants on technology. While both work with information, they take very different approaches to how it's processed. The data scientist's mind doesn't work the same way as accountants. That data scientist can tell me what's buried in the data, all the stories hidden in the data. My accountant can tell me the 30,000 foot view of the data and what the differences were every year, he said. And the example he gives is how difficult it is to train accountants on data extraction technology, such as how to strip a PDF of data without getting page after page of headers and footers. Is that really that hard though? <laughs> That's interesting because like, like he might be reinforcing his argument because I think his Twitter account, like he's implemented tech technology on it. And if you think if you tag him in a Twitter post, he automatically, automatically just retweets it retweets out to his it. followers. 
<laughs> so you can exploit this. I think I've done it before. Yeah. I was like, hey, check out the new episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast. And he just tweets it. At the key some, so it's this implementation of technology. Like it could be exploited yeah. by Patrick Accountant if you want, you know, like it totally could be exploited. Now, David, there are some folks who think that it's easier to train accountants. And one of those people is none other than Joe Woodard. Oh, okay. yeah. Who runs the conference Scaling New Heights. He says, at the end of the day, no matter how much technology there is, ultimately we're talking about accounting, something that people go to school for years to learn. Non-accountants can do accounting tasks with the right technology, noting that one does not have to be an accountant to use Quicken, but this does not mean they can necessarily do it well. In a world where quality accounting work determines the success of an accounting firm, this is important. Woodard compared it to an amateur shopping for power tools at Home Depot. Quote, you can hurt yourself with some of the stuff in there. So maybe just because you can get it, just because you can use it, doesn't mean you're an expert. I can buy a chainsaw at Home Depot, but that does not mean I can cut down a tree. Or even if I can cut one down, I don't know the right way to do it. Yeah, but I think he, like the, I, I view this question, I think Joe's missing the point. Because the technologist is going to be the person building, who's an engineer who's designing the chainsaw. Yeah. Chances are that engineer to build the chainsaw had to research how it interacts and cutting trees. He had to learn some stuff about things you cut with chainsaws. I think it's different mm -hmm. than just buying a tool. Like, I don't know. Roman Kepchik comes down on the side of accountants. And these are Easier like big, they, on like, this is the big wig opinions. Like, of course they didn't come to you, Blake. Like these guys are a whole different <laughs> level. These people, yeah, exactly. This is another level up. And then also, let's see, Jeannie Whitehouse. Oh, she, she Jeannie Whitehouse said, Rather than thinking of who's an accountant and who's a technologist, it's better to simply think of who has an analytics background, as both have certain blind spots that make it dangerous to rely entirely on one or the other. So she Amen. split the difference. Amen. It doesn't have to be so black and white. Technologists, she said, can be trained on accounting concepts, but not as well as accountants. Accountants, conversely, can certainly be trained to use technology, but won't ever be specialized programmers. That's why we need each other, right? We need to collaborate and work together. You need, you need the accountants and you need the technologists. I think part of the problem is that like the people who run firms, like the old partners are not technologists and do not understand them in many cases. At least that's how I felt working in a firm. You know, I went and got my CPA. I did my accounting stuff, but like my heart is in technology. That's my expertise. Yeah. That's what I love doing. Right. And it just always frustrated me t trying to talk to somebody who's like pure accountant. So what else do we have here? I have um, some news from Down Under. Okay. So Reckon. What's going on in Australia? So Reckon, which is Australians um, only. Australia's like, QuickBooks, right? Uh, yeah, they're, list, they're the accounting software company that's listed um, on the ASX. So they're, they're Australia's only. Because Zero is probably what? In the New Zealand stock exchange, I imagine? I don't know. Yeah, is it, well, Zero's, I think, on... Yeah, New Zealand. I don't know yeah. about Australia. So, I think both, right? I don't know. So they and so Reckon kind of is a little bit more like Sage, where they own lots of different things. They've agreed to sell their accountants practice management group to the UK's uh, UK based access group for a hundred million dollars. So basically Reckon's you may have heard of it, APS practice management software and Reckon Elite for smaller firms, they're going to um, sell that and wrap it up and Access Group is going to take that over and they're gonna work together on a smooth transition. So that's map news from them. Caseware, speaking of like big, big firms type software. So Caseware mm -hmm. rebranded. Um, and I don't remember what their old logo looks like, but this new one's pretty clean. It's nice. If you, I don't know if you go to caseware.com, it's, it's clean. So I'm assuming this is the, the rebrand. If not, like you're, it's good enough. Don't rebrand. It looks nice. <laughs> don't rebrand. It's <laughs> yeah, actually it's okay. just different. It's different. It looks I mean, good. I'm, I'm assuming it's really good. Yeah, it looks nice. I'm assuming that's the rebound. Yeah. But part of that, they, they're they um, launching new branding as the cloud-based business intelligence tool. And believe it or not, they called this tool Sherlock. <laughs> Sherlock. It consolidates data across multiple engagements so that we can analyze and deliver, insight, deliver insights on ways to be more efficient and grow faster. Um, and they have many new products and updates that are planned in the next three to five years. I think we've talked about Lockstep before. So they're yes. uh, an AR app. So they announced that they are now adding a new product offering, which is called their Inbox. So basically, this is going to allow you to, in your firm and your team, hook up all your 
email addresses into one unified inbox. You, I think there's some ability to do texting and communications with your clients. So it's interesting. I'm trying to understand like where Lockstep is headed here because they have they have error automation software, right? So this is your your billing software, your invoicing software, so you can get paid from customers, whoever it might be. They have an API, which it, it's hard to really tell, but it feels like they're offering an API to developers. So like on the locks, the receivable side, obviously they built up some expertise to sync with a bunch of accounting systems. And their API, I can't really tell, but it feels like they're offering the ability for other developers to use their API to talk to accounting software. It's not really, it's a little gray. And now they have this inbox thing. Now what's interesting is they're kind of rolling this together as one big product offering. And if I like rewind, I know that um, LivePlan created a product called uh, Outbox or Out something, Out, and I think they've killed it now. But a way to have a unified inbox for accounts. So they tried to launch a separate product and a separate brand. It was called Outpost. It was called Outpost. And it's similar. I think we've talked about apps. There's an app out there called Front, right? Where you have a mm-hmm. unified inbox for your team and you can assign who's assigning the emails or talking to them. I think uh, Zen- yeah, so what this Zendesk, what this looks like to me is a support inbox, a ticketing system, but specifically designed for accounting activity, accounting teams. So you're doing accounts receivable, you're doing collections, and it, it'll sync your accounting stuff into the support system. So maybe, and I don't know, I, I haven't seen exactly how it works, but I, I like the idea of like being able to like create tickets for outstanding receivables and then just follow up with customers via email. Do they do text? You said text. I feel like the press release really mentioned cool. text. Actually, I have it here. I can yeah. read the, the... So you can monitor your accounting KPIs and identify the best activity for customers or vendors. With actionable reports. So like nothing following falls, up on past due accounts, right? And nothing falls through because you have accounting emails, phone numbers, and to-dos. Uh-huh. You have a one-click email that's integrated with your accounting software, so you don't have to leave your workflow to go write an email, I guess. 360 so I like degree view. It's, it's very, very fluffy, yeah. but it's, it really makes really where I think is like, what's the next step? Like first, is it an inbox? And then are they getting into the firm practice management game? Like it's hard to see where they're headed here. Yeah. It, it looks to me like it would be a good option for or a good thing to consider for corporate accounting teams as a way to manage all this communication in a centralized place. It's a support system, support inbox for accountants. And that's, that's a neat, neat thing. And, in, and the other interesting thing about this, like when as you say that, like I could have my team on Slack and my corporation, but in a way, like you probably want the accounting conversations siloed out from the rest of the company's conversations, possibly. Yeah, well, and you want to be able to connect with external parties too. Yeah, right? a lot of this is communication with vendors and customers. So email in corporate life is the way you do it. So you got to have a system that can put all that in one yeah. place. I always said, like, uh, if I were starting an accounting practice again from scratch, the first thing I would put in place is some sort of support desk software. Yeah. Some way where instead of my staff communicating all through their individual inboxes, we just have one email address for clients. Clients at xyzfirm.com yep. or something. And that is where we communicate with them. And then the ticketing system make sure that we're responding to them to them in a timely manner. And you can assign it to different teammates who's responding. Yeah. And, when, yeah. and you can create rules to automatically assign a client's emails to the person who is their account manager, stuff like that. And the other thing on this, I saw they, they want to be the LinkedIn of accounting, which I thought was kind of weird, but the way they're yeah, trying to that. do this is because they want, they're going to give this away for free. So I think they're trying to get people like LinkedIn in a way at first was just like connecting and messaging people. Right. And so I think they're trying to get people into their ecosystem by offering this free inbox. And if, if you're using this inbox to manage your communications with your customers and employees, mm-hmm. you probably are going to buy other lockstep stuff in the future. So I see where their play is on that versus like if you used Front or somebody else's, they're not going to upsell mm-hmm. you on other accounting tools. So I, I kind of see where they're going with this. But Well, David, that's all the time we have today. If people want to get in touch with you, where should they do that? I'm on all the socials, just at David Leary. And it would be great if somebody wrote a review. We haven't had a review in a while. So oh, yeah. We appreciate those. On, on Apple Podcasts, you could just go to the reviews, but you got to scroll apparently to the bottom of the page. And we, since we have a lot of reviews, you got to do a lot of swiping up on your nice. iPhone. And then you find the button that says leave a review and you can leave us a review there. Or you can go to podchaser.com and leave a review there if you're not an Apple user. 
We really appreciate that. Write us a review. We will read it on the air. You can also get in touch with me. I'm at Blake T. Oliver, Blake at BlakeOliver.com. Shoot me an email with any of your thoughts about what we've talked on the sh- talked about on the show or stories you think we've missed. We love getting voicemails. You could use voice memo to record your voice. We'll listen. We might even play it on the air. And David, I'm going to see you not next week, but the following. We're going to have to catch up because I'm going away for Memorial Day. Oh, and then after that, though, we have AICP Engage. And then yep. quickly after that, we have Scaling New Heights. So we got two conferences in June. We'll see everybody at. Um, Scaling New Heights is like to some extent is getting very exciting. I know we talked about QuickBooks pulled out, but since then, I think eight or nine accounting platforms are now showing up to sponsor Scaling New Heights. It's going to be great. Yeah. crazy wild west. I, It'll be fun, I think. No, I, I love this. And it's it's giving space. Yeah, like when you when you remove, when you have the vacuum like that, all these other solutions can fill in and... And we'll hopefully we'll we'll see some new stuff that get that we've never seen before. And maybe I'm new excited. faces, like because like, yeah. honestly, like you, I came from the QuickBooks world. You came from the Zero world. Scaling New Heights has always traditionally been QuickBooks people, but now that and now that Zero, obviously there's gonna be zero people there because that zero sponsoring has been announced for a while. But now all these other ones that we've never Acumatica, like all these people we've never mm-hmm. that run, don't run our circles might start going to this conference. It'll be interesting where it goes. So I'm looking forward to that. Time for the classifieds. If you're looking to quickly grow a scalable, systematic seven-figure accounting firm without having to work 50 plus hours per week, check out Ryan Lozanis' online coaching membership, Future Firm Accelerate. Sign around Ryan's experience taking his cloud firm from scratch to sale so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You'll get online learning and topics that help you automate and systemize all aspects of your firm. You'll get coaching when you need help with implementation. And you'll also join a collaborative community of hundreds of other forward-thinking firm owners. For more details, head over to www.futurefirmaccelerate.com. Tired of clients not remembering to get W9s? Get W9 automates and streamlines the collection and storage of W9s. Get W9 has a QBO integration, and they have a partner program that pays 25% commissions. Get W9 plans start at only $19 a year. Visit getw9.tax today to get started. That is getw9.tax. Are you looking for a dream job in cloud accounting? We have the job for you. Advisors for Change delivers cloud accounting systems to small and medium nonprofit organizations. Join our team of friendly and collaborative nonprofit accounting professionals while working from home. Our systems associate will join our experienced systems manager to implement and support cloud accounting systems such as QBO, Bill.com, Divi, Sassan, and others. To learn more, head to our website at advisorsforchange.com slash join dash our dash team. That's advisorsforchange.com slash join dash our dash team. We'll find a link to the full position description on Indeed. Are you ready to take your life and bookkeeping business to the next level? Are you aspiring to start your own bookkeeping business? Then hop on over to the Ambitious Bookkeeper podcast where you'll find encouragement, support, tools, resources, practical strategies, and actionable tips on starting, growing, and running a successful bookkeeping firm. Plus, listen to guest expert interviews that will help you elevate your business and enhance your life. Go to ambitiousbookkeeper.com slash podcast and subscribe now. That's ambitiousbookkeeper.com slash podcast. Hey, podcast listeners, it's Blake, and I wanted to let you know about a new show I'm working on with CPA slash comedian Greg Kite and blogger slash former CPA Caleb Newquist. It's called Oh My Fraud, and it's a podcast all about financial crimes. That's right, a true crime podcast for accountants by accountants. Caleb and Greg are going to come together every couple weeks to unpack their favorite frauds and explore the circumstances, psychology, and interpersonal dynamics involved. They also fully indulge in victim-blaming the defrauded widows, orphans, infirm, and feeble-minded, because who can resist? If you fancy yourself a trusted advisor, or prefer your true crime with spreadsheets instead of corpses, listen to this show to learn what to watch out for, and to keep your clients, your firm, and even yourself safe. To subscribe, go to ohmyfraud.com, or search Oh My Fraud on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Want to get the word out about your newsletter, webinar, party, Facebook group, podcast, ebook, job posting, or that fancy Excel macro you just created? Why not let the listeners of the Cloud Accounting Podcast know by running a classified ad? Hit the show notes for the link to get more info.